Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, how good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head that runs down upon the beard upon the beard of Aaron and runs down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hills of Zion. For there has God anointed the blessing, life forevermore. We 
reading from the first book of John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declared to it the eternal life that was with the life the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sin of the whole world. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called a twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, on this second Sunday in the season of Easter, we hear the story of what happened immediately after the resurrection. You see, news spread very quickly that Jesus had risen from the tomb and all of the people rejoiced. They were so happy that a feast was proclaimed for days. People were partying. Adults were eating food and making merry and drinking. Children were gathering candy. The Easter Bunny was so excited that he laid an extra egg. Of course, none of this happened. As a matter of fact, it was quite the opposite. You see, even though we celebrate the resurrection as the central event of the Christian life, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead who opens the way to eternal life for all of us here, the symbol of God's profound and unending love for all creation, even though we celebrate it now, we do so on behalf of the first people who learned about the resurrection who themselves weren't in such a partying mood. It was a strange occurrence, and they were trying to make sense of what had happened. They did not have the benefit of 2,000 years of hindsight. And so instead, they were struck by shock, and awe, and fear, and doubt. So I'm sad to say that in the first week after the resurrection, 
these were the things that the people who knew Jesus, Jesus best were feeling. They were not in a partying mood. Rather, they were trying to grapple with the profound thing that they had just seen and experienced. You hear the story right here in the Gospel of John. The disciples had shut themselves up in the upper room out of fear. The Gospel says out of fear of the Jews, and what it means by that is that they themselves, as faithful Jews, were now part of a splinter group, and they didn't know what was going to be happening to them. Would they be exiled from their community? Would there be political repercussions to them? It was a completely new and utterly strange territory for these devout men. But one of them wasn't actually so afraid, Thomas. I always like to imagine that while everyone was sitting up in that upper room locked together, that at a certain point they realized they'd be there for a while and decided that they were hungry. So they sent Thomas out to get the groceries. And while he was gone, Jesus appeared to them. When Thomas came back, they told him about this occurrence, and Thomas, being the reasonable person that he was, didn't quite believe them. You know, a lot had happened that week, and you can see things when you're stressed. I always like to think that that's how Thomas approached this situation. And so he set upon his journey that made him known for all time as Doubting Thomas, the one who didn't actually believe until Jesus appeared to him. This truly is one of my favorite stories in all of the gospel. It's almost just as strange as the story of the resurrection itself. Thomas is so human. This is such a believable situation. What would have been very odd would have been a story about great celebration and feasting in the wake of the resurrection. But instead what we have is a portrait of real people when they respond to something that they don't understand. And one of those reactions, which is perfectly natural, is doubt. And that's what Thomas gives us in this story. Now there's one way to think about the story of Thomas and his doubts. And I like this way very much, even if it doesn't tell the entire story. We live in a time in the United States when our religious landscape has become very fundamentalist. In many churches, any type of doubt or dissent is greeted with fear and anxiety itself. People can be exiled from the community for any kind of dissension or doubt that they might espouse. It's the job of preachers and spiritual leaders to make sure that everyone is absolutely certain of what has happened, that we are all on the same page. The story of Thomas, right there in the Bible, introduces a totally different kind of idea. Thomas is a hero of sorts, the only one of the disciples to whom Jesus speaks directly. In this reading of the story, we can see that Jesus welcomes Thomas' doubt. Not only welcomes, but offers his very own body as proof to Thomas, an act of incredible intimacy that you couldn't possibly believe that the Son of God would offer to someone who was expressing his doubts. So there it is. For those of us who want to follow Jesus but have doubts ourselves, this reading of the story gives us a way to be able to be people of faith who at times truly do have doubts. If that rings true at all for you, then you and I are very similar. Of course I have my doubts about this whole story, about this whole enterprise, about this tradition that goes back so many years, that in addition to doing so many wonderful things for people, has also caused so much harm. Yes, I have doubts in my heart, and sometimes I think, that if Jesus appeared to me, I would ask him, what the heck was all this about? There's a quote that is probably going to be said across Episcopal and other mainline Protestant denominations this day, this Doubting Thomas Day. 
And it goes like this. The opposite of faith isn't doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. That's a nice thought. It's actually attributed to the author Anne Lamott, who writes in the 21st century. So as you can see, it's not really an old thought. It's something new, something that gives contemporary Christians who want to not leave their brain and their reasonable faculties at the door some way of conceiving of how to make sense of this mysterious event that we call the resurrection. But again, I don't think that that sentiment captures the entirety of the story. And let me tell you why. For Jesus' disciples and to Thomas, that type of sentiment that Anne Lamott gives us would have been completely unintelligible. They would not have understood what she is talking about. In the ancient world, everybody had faith. There were no exceptions. The question was what you have faith in. Do you have faith in the God of Israel? Do you have faith in the God who is the emperor? Do you have faith in this Jesus? Do you have faith in someone else, something else? To be honest, we're still pretty similar. Even people who don't call themselves religious still have faith in something. And that is going to be one of the great theological questions of the next hundred years. What exactly we all have faith in. But back in the day, what this gospel story is trying to tell people is that the first disciples were being challenged to have faith in Jesus, to change their faith landscape and their focus of their faith to this Jesus of Nazareth, who miraculously had been crucified and risen from the dead. So the question that I find interesting about this whole story isn't so much one of doubt, but one in a slightly different category. It's a question of trust. Whom do you trust? What do you trust? Trust is an absolutely essential ingredient to faith. And in one way, you could say that the opposite of faith is mistrust. If you read the story of Thomas and the disciples and Jesus through the lens of trust, you can see that what's happening here is a profound bond of trust being forged between Jesus and his people. First of all, Thomas trusts Jesus enough to voice his doubts, to say that he's not entirely certain about this whole thing. He trusts his brother disciples enough to be a lone dissenter in the crowd. He trusts that he is not going to be punished or kicked out or chastised, but rather that the trust among them built on love is so deep and so strong that it can hold even his doubts. And then there's the other side to it, the side that is like a second Easter miracle. Thomas trusts Jesus, but Jesus trusts Thomas even more. To respond to Thomas's doubts, Jesus offers his very wound, the thing that makes him the resurrected Lord. That's what this story is about to me. God trusts us, whether we deserve it or not, and so often we don't. God trusts us enough that God chooses to make God's self vulnerable to us. Because there's really no true trust bond that can be made without the two parties being vulnerable to one another. God trusts us. Our doubts, our questions, our mistakes, our foibles, our sins, our crimes, the things that we do, the things that we don't do, God still trusts us. And if God trusts us that much, then we should be able to trust God. Even when things don't entirely make sense, 
even when the idea of the resurrection is brand new, even when we enter into a different phase of our faith life, even when things seem difficult, even when it seems like the country is falling apart or the planet is falling apart, God trusts us. God trusts us. And we can trust God. Of all the things that are wrong in our society and in our common life today, to me, one of the underlying symptoms that we have is a lack of trust. It seems that there are divides, political, social, economic, you name them, in our country. And the two sides are at odds with one another because they can't find a way to trust one another. And that's for a good reason. Blind trust is no trust at all. It doesn't make sense to trust another side that wants to harm you. But in the story of Jesus and Thomas, what you can see is the opposite. Trust is built on shared experience. Trust is based on the ability to ask questions. Trust is based on the ability to hear questions and respond to them. And trust is based on love. These are things that each and every one of us can do. And every time we do them, they build trust with the people who are closest to us in our lives, with the people in our communities, and eventually in our city, our country, and our world. Practicing a way of being with one another the way that Jesus is with Thomas and Thomas is with Jesus is the way of building up the kingdom of God in which everyone can trust one another. And that trust, believe me, heals. It changes lives. And over time, you truly can see the glory of the resurrection in those bonds of trust. So the question today for me with the story of the Downing Thomas is one of how we will respond to God's trust in us. When Thomas challenged Jesus, Jesus showed him his wound and offered it to him. Thomas then accepted Jesus' challenge and trusted him. How can we learn to trust a God who trusts us that much? How can we learn to think of our doubts and our fears as part of a whole nexus of divine trust? How can we use those tools that God has given us to trust one another in our lives, in our communities, and in the world? Doing this makes Easter joy. Doing this makes us see the resurrection. God trusts in you. Trust in God back as the way to celebrate this Easter. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, 
he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Rejoicing at Christ's resurrection, we offer up our joys and concerns to the God who fills the world with love. Now let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For the people of God and for the church, that it may proclaim the love of Christ in word and deed, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Lawrence, our bishop, and for All Saints Church, that God may pour out on us the spirit of love and forbearance. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For Joe, our president, Kathy, our governor, Eric, our mayor, and for all who bear authority, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For the victims of war, hunger, decease, and violence in this country and around the world, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For our children, especially those who suffer from any need or danger, and for the strength to care for and protect them, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. In thanksgiving for the blessings of this life and for eyes to see God's hand at work around us, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of the bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning and welcome to All Saints Church. I'm Stephen Pollockus, I'm the rector here at All Saints and I want to extend a very warm welcome to any visitors and guests who are here with us today. If it's your first Sunday with us, please know you bless us with your presence. We'd love to get to know you better. Please introduce yourself to me or to another member of the congregation. We would also love to stay in touch. There is a, a virtual online guest register on our website at allsaintsparkslope.org. There's also a physical guest register at the back of the church. We'd love to be able to stay in touch with you and let you know about all the great things happening in this parish. Following this little coffee hour express downstairs in the lounge, and then at 11.30, we will begin our weekly Sunday forum. And uh, today we will begin viewing a series uh, produced by the Office of Global Partnerships um, that speaks to Palestinian Christians uh, about their experience of Easter. So um, it's a very interesting series and I encourage you all to uh, come and join it. There's a full list of announcements in the back of your bulletin. Next Sunday at 5 p.m., we'll have our April Sound Bath Even Song, which combines uh, evening prayer with healing sound. It's a really amazing service. I encourage everyone to come. And then in two weeks' time, we will have a tour of the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Hopefully, that will be near the peak of some of the most amazing things happening in the garden. Uh, we will meet at the Eastern Parkway entrance at 2 p.m. on April 21st. Uh, for more information, you can email uh, Allegra Lovejoy. Her email address is there in the, uh, 
in the bulletin right here at the back of your bulletin. We want to extend our Christian sympathies to uh, longtime All Saints member Marva Griffith, whose mother Doris passed away a few weeks ago. Marva is in Barbados um, attending to family affairs, and uh, we ask that you keep her all in your prayers uh, for the funeral service, which will take place on Tuesday. Uh, may light perpetual shine upon Doris. Now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right to glorify you, Father, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day, and beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing.
We acclaim you, Holy Lord, glorious in power. Your mighty works reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care, so that in obedience to you, our creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help, so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again, you called us into covenant with you, and through the prophets, you taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you loved the world so much that in the fullness of time, you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the, Virgin, by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners, freedom, to the sorrowful, joy. To fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death, and rising from the grave, destroyed death, and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us, he sent the Holy Spirit, his own first gift for those who believe, to complete his work in the world, and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them, he took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory, and offering to you from the gifts you have given us this bread and this cup. We praise you and we bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we pray to you, Lord our God. Lord, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this cup and bread may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. And grant that we may find our inheritance with all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ, and in Christ. All honor and glory are yours, almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
one cup. All right, now come on. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always.